All right, guys. Hey, it's Brad within the studio with MJ. Uh, we are back for another day. And I am here with a really cool guy. I don't remember the last time. I mean, I don't remember the last time you and I spoke, but it's been a while since I've actually seen you. But uh, this is a, a keyboard synth arranger, orchestrator, extraordinaire, and really, really cool guy, Mr. Michael Boddicker. So, Michael, thank you for... Uh, for hanging out in the studio. Really my pleasure, Brad. Uh, it's great to see you, and it's great always to talk to you. Tell me about, tell me a little bit about you, where you come from, and how this, how your journey started with, with Michael Jackson. Well, uh, it used to be that prior to being a synth guy, I was a uh, clavinet with an Oberheim uh, auto VCF pedal, a bow, 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 you know, like, like that. And I was, uh, because of that, I was on a lot of Motown records. Wow. I, uh, back in the early days, uh, almost nobody that was, uh, you know, a mainstream pop star was using uh, synths and, uh, but, the R&B records in the early 70s were way, way into what can we do to be unique and, uh, you know, the Isley Brothers. Uh, and, and part of that was was Motown. And uh, so I did a lot of work at Motown the first six, seven years I was in town. And, um, so you, you know, were, those guys over... You were, doing, you were doing Motown sessions, but in L.A. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes. In Motown West. In fact, the first session I ever did in Los Angeles was with uh, Ray Parker uh, and then Ollie Brown on their first sessions in Los Angeles. Really? We both we both came out within a day of each other. OK. And we and we ended up working for. Oh, yeah, I got to tell you, Bill Cosby. We did three albums for Bill Cosby. <laughs> Uh, back when he was actually a comedian, right. and uh, it was it was great. I sold three songs, uh, worked on three albums, recorded a whole bunch of stuff myself, and uh, made great friends, lifelong friends with Ray Parker and with Ollie Brown. Uh, still my friends, uh, uh, you know, see Ray at church every now and then, right. and uh, uh, it it was interesting because it, and I think because of Ray. I got introduced uh, to Gene Page, and okay. that was that was, and if, pardon the pun, but it, instrumental in in my career. I I ended up then working for uh, a guy who uh, uh, James Carmichael, who, uh, as an arranger at Motown okay. before he became the producer of the Commodores and about five other groups I worked with, and then Lionel Richie which that, you know, that whole story was life-changing for me yeah. working on Lionel Richie's records. But, uh, you know, with, uh, so I'm working at Motown. I play on, in those days, Sonny Burke, uh, James Jamerson Sr. playing bass, Sonny Burke playing uh, piano, right. uh, James Gadson playing drums. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think it was David T. Uh, uh, Walker, playing guitar uh, or Wawa, you know, could have been Wawa Watson, but I think it was David T. And then I was playing clavinet with a, a, an Oberheim VCF pedal going bow, 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 <laughs> along with the bass part in key places. And, and uh, we came into the session at what uh, is a Hollywood Sound Studios. We came in and we um, would record in one three hour session, we would record three different songs in three different keys because Motown wasn't sure which artist was going to do wow. those songs. Ser and seriously, seriously, in one hour? No, in three hours. In three hours. Okay, so one hour three per hour. song. So, you know, yeah, but the three hours, yeah. I, I mean, uh, one hour per three different keys of songs, yeah, I'll, I'll, a song, right? So nine, nine tr takes, if you will, Right. nine takes, and uh, it, it was just a great experience. I just loved it. James Carmichael still to this day is one of the, my favorite 
uh, a ranger. That's, you know, he just carried that through into production value. And he's just phenomenal. What he does to records, if you listen to those, and you'll appreciate this, not to get too technical, but mm -hmm. if you set the faders all the way across, at zero. right? Instead of, instead of, oh, I want to have that line come out, I think I'll, I'll, right. I'll push, push it up. James would build into the arrangement so that uh, that that guitar part that went three notes in that part, it would just be doubled by something else that made it rise up for that second and then back down. That's and, awesome. And he's just a brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, but so so I start, I worked on the Jackson Five at Motown uh, yep. and uh, in, but, as part of that record. But Bob, and, you're not, you're not that old. You're you're like 44 years old. Stop. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> No, no. Uh, I, I, I have, I, I, I'm still 18 in my heart, <laughs> but no, I've been, I, I was, I started playing records like that in 73, 74. Wow. Uh, so the, and I'd already been through college and through, you know, so i uh, been through uh, some road dog years and stuff. Sure. The, um, uh, after that, then I worked with uh, Michael Jackson as part of the Jacksons. Okay. I worked on all three records, and I did things with Michael during that period. Uh, besides uh, "Shake Your Body," "Shake Your Love Body it. Down to the Ground," Love Love down, Love it. Yep. Which, which I think Greg Fillingain started out as the producer of. Okay. And. Uh, which Brad, if you haven't interviewed Greg, it just would be. I need to talk be, to Greg. He's he's phenomenal. He's yeah. doing great. Uh, I have a project coming up with him. Uh, the and he's got two little baby boys. He's doing. He's just living wow. the life now. That's awesome. The uh, yeah. So we're uh, uh, we're working on the Jacksons records, uh, and then Michael at that time is producing Diana Ross. And I'm working with him on Diana Ross. And when the Jacksons go out on tour, I'm creating the opening music. You know, when the lights go down and everybody starts yeah. cheering yeah. And, and, and you see smoke coming out and all that. That's my music that's behind there. And, and, and the guys start coming out on stage one by one. And by the way, that era of the Jackson Five, uh, the Jacksons, yeah. they were phenomenal. I got to see them at the forum and I was at their rehearsals. I, I set up sounds for them on their synths and stuff back, back when they finally got memory into synthesizers because it wasn't always like that, right? right. There used to not be memory in there. And uh, uh, I would set up the sounds for him. And then I, I worked on his production of Diana Ross on Muscles. And then uh, about that same time, I was working on George Benson and Donna Summer with Quincy Jones. Wow. Right? So uh, first George Benson and then Donna Summer. And then Quincy and Michael got together. So I was already working with Quincy and I was already working with Michael. Right. And um, in fact, Quincy tried to get me to record She's Out of My Life before Michael. And I just went, it's like being Johnny Ray and having your first hit single be Cry. And you have this sad song that everybody wants you to play every night. And it's like, right. you know, with, with Michael to do it at 20 years into his career, 25 years into his career, <laughs> he had a lot of other songs. He didn't always have to play that one. But right. anyway, it was, a, it, was a, it was a really great time. And it was a great time in the industry because... If you if you look at the the record sales, they're crazy. Then, oh, you know uh, if there are records that Michael Jackson made that sold 170 million copies. I personally had three copies of Thriller. Right. You know, uh, and, and and that's just me in my house. Doesn't count the rest of my family. Right. Right. And and uh, but. 170 million copies at ten dollars a copy. I know it. Uh, it. It back in the 70s. You just go. You know the. It w it was a great time to be part of the music industry, and we had um, layers of musicians. Mm -hmm. What Quincy would do on records like that is he would uh, he would cast. Oh, this song needs this drummer. You know, yep. it needs Indugu Chancellor. Yep. God rest his soul. Uh, oh, oh, Steve Ferroni is the perfect drummer for this. Yep. Oh, John Robinson, 
you know, would be, and then John Robinson essentially took over, but, you know, Harvey Mason was in there, yeah. uh, Jeff Picaro on a couple of songs, and, and he would cast everybody according to the flavor, but uh, because of, you know, one of your mentors, Bruce Wadian, it still had this homogenous sound to it, yep. because it was all captured by the same man uh, in Bruce. Uh, yeah, it, it was it was great. It if you look at any time in the music industry to be alive, and to have been participating, that was it. And yet here today, you know, there are still people making records and still reaching a lot of people. The 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 object I never heard. It was only in the in the early '90s that I heard people addressing that as a financial issue. We. We made records so that we would reach millions of people and enhance their lives. Right. That's why we made music. We made records so that you would get a joy from it. And hopefully you'd give us a dollar. But the, the basic premise was let's do something good. Let's do something great. Not, not, oh, let's go make a lot of money. Right. That no, I, a I, product. I, no, I, no, I totally agree. So, so with, do you remember when you first met Michael? I mean, I know he was a young, young guy then, but oh, yeah. did he, did he stand out of the, obviously it was with the J5. Um, he, he, he was with, well, uh, when we started talking directly, because remember in those days, uh, there was, uh, uh, and uh, please forgive me, uh, I think he's gone on now. But uh, head of Motown had a right hand guy, okay. and he he was actually in the studio as the producer. But then Reggie Dozier uh, would be the engineer, and you'd have great arrangers like Gene Page and James Carmichael, McKinley Jackson writing the charts, and and uh, then the the guys in the band. So. Michael Jackson or Diana Ross were never at those right. sessions. That uh, it it was later. I remember calling the house. I live five blocks from Michael's old house where he was out at Havenhurst. Yeah, Havenhurst. And and so uh, I was close enough that I I at a certain point when we were working together on the Jacksons, I call him up and and Joe would answer the phone. No, they're in rehearsals. Take it. You can't talk to them now. You know, call call another time. And right. and he not very nice, but you know, uh, but you know, I was showing up at that house, and uh, I remember one Christmas weekend, when Christmas was on Sunday, I was at Michael's house with a mini moog doing a bass part on a song he was writing. Really? And oh yeah, yeah. And uh, so you know, we, and we hung out. You know, but. But it was always, Michael is, he had such a work ethic. Uh, he was such, uh, and I'll, you know, I'll say it. It's, he was a workaholic. Sure. He, he was in the hospital bed at a certain point on a Diana Ross record. He was in a hospital bed having fallen down, uh, collapsed from uh, exhaustion. And he was still on the phone with us from the hospital. Yeah six, seven hours a day trying to produce the record over the phone while we were in there uh, making the, the biggest Tom Tom sound we could possibly make uh, where it goes, I want my souls, but do 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 black, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it, was, uh, uh, it was a great experience. See, Mike, Michael was, he had no boundaries when it came to experimenting. Nope and and uh being creative and being able to embrace us you know in the studio yeah I, and i'll say specifically in my relationship with him you know uh he he i i never until the later years ever felt like he didn't want to hear or receive everything possible from me Right. You know, it it wasn't d during that era, during during the like say the early seventies through about nineteen ninety two, 
that whole thing was just a love fest. We, yeah. uh, I actually went up to the University of California, Santa Barbara, UCSB, and I, I did like days and days of experimenting with computers uh, to make sounds. You know, Michael was always like, give me something nobody's ever heard. No one's ever heard. Yep. And, and uh, that's a tall order to do that every single day. Okay. Give me a drum sound that nobody's ever heard. Give me, right. you know, give, give, you give me a beat that nobody's ever heard. Mm -hmm. Give me a synthesizer sound that nobody's ever heard. And so always pushing that, that edge. Uh, I don't know if you saw, have you ever seen Captain EO? <laughs> yes, Mr. Boddicker, I've seen Captain EO. <laughs> so Captain EO, I'd have to meet Michael Jackson at 3 a.m. at Disneyland so we could sit in the Captain EO exhibit and watch the film and talk about the different sound design that was going to go on. So the opening, which was kind of like something I'd done for him for the opening of the Jacksons show, sure. but that star field that's in the opening, yep, yep, that, that's all mine. Yep. And and so you come in and you get you get immersed in this thing, the and the LED lights, which were a big deal at that time, were flashing yep. behind the curtain, and uh, and all the little star, the belly kind of stuff is all mine, and. Uh, but but he couldn't do it during the day. If he went there during the day, yeah, he would have yeah. had to dress up in one of his uh, many disguises because he couldn't have gotten in Disneyland without being mobbed. Right. You know? Now, did Captain, he ever do that that you remember, Brad? Do you remember being in the studio when he came in dressed as somebody else and you didn't even recognize him? I, I, I was at a Janet Jackson concert uh, in... Uh, uh, Radio City Music Hall, 1994, and we were there working on the History album, and Michael got us a bunch of seats, and they were in the, the very back. We were like the back of Radio City. It's like, yeah, thanks. Your sister really took care of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I had the same exact experience. <laughs> <laughs> but we're like three rows from the back of Radio City, and I figured Michael would be there, but I figured he'd be way in the front row. No, he's right across the aisle from me in just this stupid disguise with big sideburns and a cap. And he's just, and I'm not going to pretend to dance, but he is just, he's in the, the aisle dancing. And I go up to him, and I'm like, you know, everyone within 100 feet knows it's you, right? And he's like, shh. I'm like, you do you, man. So yeah, he didn't yeah, use it. He didn't I came into the disguises to the to the studio, but I did see him in. Oh, public. I it, it, there were a couple of times uh, where I showed up, and you know he's completely uh, dressed like a. Uh, uh, he's got uh, he's got double knit polyester pants on. Yep, yep. That are about five inches too short. Yeah. And and just like that orangish brown color. Mm -hmm. And 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 he's got a wig on and he's got uh, a prosthetic teeth. And and, you know, I really I didn't recognize him at first. Yeah. And and uh, it took me a, a minute to really get to the place where I realized that, uh, no, this wasn't Michael's right. relative. Right. I, he was being purported to be introduced as though he was some relative. And, <laughs> uh, and no, but, but anyway, yeah, That's it awesome. was interesting. You know, he was an interesting guy. And, but back to his work ethic, he worked all yeah. the time. Yeah. He danced all the time. And that's one of the things that, you know, when, when you want to do every job to that level, there's a certain place where we have to realize our human limitations, you know, where the, that was, you know, Quincy's job was to produce great records. Bruce's job was, Bruce Swedeen's job was to engineer great records. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best songwriters in the world were writing giving their best material possible to Michael Jackson. And Tom Baylor was, you know, arranging vocal parts and, and Rod Temperton. Rod Temperton and vocal, Jerry, vocal and Jerry parts. And, yeah. and, and the best musicians in the world participating. And, and then we got to that, through that, where we got to the place where, oh no, I want to do all of that. 
I want to be the producer, the arranger, the songwriter. And what I've seen, when I see this going on, and I've seen it happen in a couple of different camps because I've been able to work with a lot of people. When when people don't want to share the responsibility, right? You 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 then uh, end up with somebody who's not the best at their job in all chairs. Nobody can be the best at their job in all chairs you know that's that's why we have brand brad sunberg's yeah actually i remember you setting up the reverb sounds for bruce on the early lexicons because you know he he knew he liked the sound of it sure he loved the sound of it and he uh uh, knew that that's what he wanted but if you gave him the box and asked him to set it up the way that he liked it he needed you to do that Sure. So he he had you, he had Eddie Cherney, you know, people that went on to have their own brilliant careers yeah. uh, as as their as his assistant Matt Forger, uh, as his assistant uh, engineers, and uh, and Matt went on to be responsible for a lot of other things as did you yep. in the camp, but uh, in, anyway, so we're back in the early days of of Michael Jackson, and we just hit it off. Good. You know, I, I was a workaholic at that time as well. If what, what, I'm not still. Did, did Michael, I mean, I, I think I know the answer to this. Michael had a nickname for you? Actually, it was Quincy's okay. nickname. Qu- Quincy had, Quincy's. Y- yep. Yeah, Quincy, it, and it was a misnomer. <laughs> so, you know, in the days in the days of modular Moog's, I, my modular Moog is in my uh, studio, but I... I I uh, would wear the patch cords around my neck. Yep. And, and on, I love this. Uh, on uh, the, it wasn't Smothers Brothers, it was on Laugh, Laugh-In. Wow. Yep. On Laugh-In. Yep. Uh, Lily Tomlin, who was a telephone operator. Yep. And she'd, she'd have the patch cords around her neck and she'd patch them in and go one ringy dingy, two ringy dingy. And, and uh, so I had my Moog patch cords around my neck and I would patch him in, uh, and and so he called me. Quincy had a nickname for everybody. Yep. Quincy called me Lily. Once Quincy gives you a name, you, that's it for life. He, Carol Bayer Sager was network, network, because her initials were CBS. Okay. CBS like network. Network. Uh, and and he was just brilliant. You knew. You knew if he liked you that you had a, you a nickname. nickname and if yep. he didn't call you by your nickname you were a deep doo-doo you weren't going to be around for a while <laughs> well or or i mean i i think it was he he was able to correct people you know in, in what i experienced over working with quincy for over 20 years he was able to correct people and put them into what he thought was his line yeah you know which 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 was a lot of stratifying. We're and we're talking about the same kind of thing where you you go, oh no, you're the synth player. Yep. I don't care if you won a Grammy as a songwriter on my projects. You're the synth player. I don't want to hear about lyric suggestions from yep. you. You know, I call and, well, and, I call that pigeonholing. When, yeah. Once once Quincy pigeonholes you, that's where you are, and it's hard yeah. oh, to yeah. break out of that. That's right. Like. Uh, uh, the song that we were talking about today, the way you make me feel, yep. uh, I actually was, uh, I had written a song that actually won a Grammy and I had done the same kind of sound on that song for, uh, it was a Laura Branigan song called Imagination from Flashdance. Yeah. And, and uh, the sound that's on the intro, uh, Quincy had heard what I had done uh, with, uh, Phil Ramone, and uh, uh, he said, "You know, can you can you do that kind of thing on the beginning of this intro?" And because uh, it was just a drum beat, it was just a drum beat, and the synth bass, that flappy blah 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 yep. blah 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 blah, and uh, and and you hear that, you know, you can hear the tom toms that Phil Collins was that, you know big tom tom with yep. a gated echo yep and uh and there is my snap that 
and and Quincy, you know, he just he didn't get it. It was like kind of like, oh, you know, stop turning the knobs and, and just let it sit there. But right. but you have to, if if you don't play it, the synthesizer becomes an organ. You know, not that organs yeah. are bad. No, I, because I get it. A, a B3 Hammond with a Leslie on it, and you're manipulating the draw bars. There's a lot of changes that go mm -hmm. on, and it breathes. Uh, and uh, but, you know, wh when when I'm playing the filter, uh, and it's snapping, it's like that yep. kind of sound. And and instead of having to be the same pitch, I'm going. Duk -a -duk -a -duk -a -duk -a give it some personality right i'm 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 being a percussionist if you right will. right and uh and uh so uh on that that song uh that song those are those are the things that i remember most about playing on it the the people that were in the room like we mentioned besides quincy uh, Rod Temperton would almost always be there. Uh, Tom Baylor would almost always be there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bruce, Jer you, Jerry was there quite a bit. Jerry, hey, oh my word. Yep. People, I don't think people know the contribution. Right. And, and what people need to understand about everybody who was in that room, nobody was playing video games. Nobody was checking their cell phone messages. Nobody was, you know, hanging out, telling jokes. We were in the back of the room listening to every playback right. and giving every idea we possibly could, throwing it all forward and seeing if we could help out in any way. And, and it, it was just, it was a phenomenal era. And, and, and Quincy's brilliant at that. Yeah. Quincy was brilliant at bringing people together, making them feel special in their own area. Yes. And bringing out the best. All right. So let's, let's jump back to the way you make me feel. Um, what, when you first walked in, um, I mean, were you, you were there from when Michael presented the song or they, they brought you in pretty early, oh. right? Well, no, I was there certain things like that. I mean, on, on Thriller, I was there when it was Starlight. It right. was, it's a starlight, starlight yep. night, right? And and it got changed from 10 o'clock at night till 10 o'clock in the morning. Rod Temperton rewrote the lyric because the Quincy said, yeah, I, I want to toughen this up. And I was there on the phone I, I, when Quincy called Vincent Price. In fact, before, right before we excuse me, right before we talked, uh, began this interview, I was on the phone with the guy who recorded Vincent Price going, you know, I, I'd really like to get a certificate saying that I recorded uh, Vincent Price for this uh, part of the, the voiceover. Really? really? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Andy Morris, who has Buzzy's recording, who still does great business. Okay. He's, He's tearing it up over there for all the people, you know, you and I have a microphone, we have digital capability and we can do this all day long, but a lot of stars, you know, they, they don't, you know, and maybe Will Smith has a studio at home, uh, Dr. Dre for sure does, but uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I you know, actually, I actually built Will Smith's studio, but that's another story. But, but there keep you going. go. There you go. But, but he's a, he's a musical artist as well. Right. And, and there are a lot of, of stars who, to do a voiceover, they, they don't have the ability to have a microphone right. and a mic pre and get the right levels themselves and all that. They go down to Buzzy's recording and he does stuff all over the world. And he's the guy who recorded uh, Vincent Price. That's awesome. And, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, shout out to Andy Morris. He, and yep. Andy Morris, he started recording. He did so many Jackson's records, uh, the Jackson five records, but in Detroit. Wow. And okay. Andy Morris uh, was very in instrumental again. There we go. Mm -hmm. In that, in those early days of Michael Jackson and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, things that I didn't even think about. Uh, at, at that time, they had like a malt in the studio where everybody would kind of plug into a malt and, and it would go to a track 
You know, you, people people don't know that. They think that you have complete isolated control over everything. Right. It, there, there was a the whole era of the '40s. There was one microphone. The the late '40s, one microphone, sure. and a vocalist in front of it, and a harp player about three feet back, yeah. and the rhythm section about twenty feet back, and all the players, and they all it sounds perfectly mixed. Yeah. Because they all played right in the room. And at Motown, they still were doing that kind of technology where you weren't isolating every instrument or every part of an instrument on a, a separate track. It was performed live right. and performed all bounced down at the same time. It had to be perfect. And and Andy Andy Morris was part of that. It, wow. it's, it's a, it's, he's got a great history. You'd love to meet him. I, I'm trying to think about it. I mean, I, I was just kind of in a different in a different circle, but I'm sure I've maybe crossed paths with him with him somewhere. But uh, tell tell him huge respect from Orlando. Uh, I will. My approach to synthesizers and and on the synthesizers that I did for uh, Michael was using whatever tool I could to make a synthesizer sound good. Because remember, I'm talking back in the day before synthesizers had digital reverb units and huh. delay units and phasers and all that built in. It was just oscillators, filters, and envelope generators. And we did, uh, all that stuff was after the fact. So I almost always used some kind of a digital delay, like a prime time, a lexicon prime time, yep. which was fantastic uh, to be able to take an instrument, and you know this, uh, your microphone technique, okay. Mm -hmm. so. If you, if you want to take an instrument and set it back in the track, and Bruce did this all the time, he would add more reverb to it and it would come back. Wash it out a little it, bit. It play, play, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I could take a synthesizer, instead of being like right in your face competing with the lead vocalist, you could take and put a little delay around it, you know, a, 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 a couple of very fast kind of yep. things. In, in, in the background and, and it would pull it back in space. Yeah. And then if, if I put the, the digital uh, or the uh, uh, space echo on it, then it would even uh, get dreamier, if you will, and, and come back. And, and again, my, my purpose in that day was to be the ear candy. So right. I'm trying not to compete with the drummer or compete with the the lead instruments or compete with the lead vocalist, mm -hmm. but just add colors in the background that kind of pique your interest every right. now and then. Some frosting. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. Frosting on the cake. Yep. There you go. Looking back, I mean, you you were with Michael 30, I mean, on and off three decades. Oh. Four? <laughs> oh, easy, easy. From 74, 75, uh, 75, 85, 95. 95. It was already very difficult working with Michael in the studio. You know, from right. about 92 to 95, it got a little stretched. And, and, and he, he was, again, we talked about that, trying to do all jobs. Right. Where, right. Where you know, it was, it was a different. Literally, era. one of my ex my experiences at the end in 1995 was he, called, you know, I I want you to put a guitar solo on this song I'm working on. So he sends over the tape, and the tape's got a click. Right. And I said, Michael, there there's no music on it. There's no music on it. I know well, exactly. Just what... just put a guitar solo on it. <laughs> I go, I go, Michael, what key is the song going to be on? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, Lily, I'll call, I'll call you back. And and then he'd call me back and say, it, it's in the key of E. I said, okay, what bar does the guitar solo start at? Uh, I'll call you back. And, and he'd call me back and he'd go, okay, at bar 36. Okay, how long is the guitar solo, Michael? Uh he called me back about eight times. Right. And then after I sent him something, uh, uh, he said, uh, Lily, I want you to do 10 guitar solos just like that. <laughs> I said, 10, 10 I mean, guitar solos? Right. Like, 
like, like exactly the same. I, I said, so, so I'll, I'll go get the best guitar player. I'll get Mike Thompson. I'll get Mike Landau. I'll get Steve Lukather, you know, uh, all the guys that I can call in and sure. we'll just, you know, have a, a day of it. And he's like, no, 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 no. I want you to play all the guitar songs. Okay. So synthesized guitar. Right. And, and ended up that he requested that I play 80 guitar solos. Seriously. Seriously. And then when I got to the studio, he had asked about five other people to do almost the same. He had over 200 guitar <laughs> solos. And, and when you're trying to make a product at that, and, and, and a lot of people don't understand this in the no. creative product, where you have to be able to make a decision at a certain point. You know, James Carmichael yeah. was brilliant at that. He used to give me a heart attack on, on the record, Hello!, I, he said, Michael, can you double that oboe part with a, a you know, like a, a, a so I, I doubled the oboe part with the synthesis. And you know where that, where that uh, string swell is there, would you do one of your vocoder parts? So I did a vocoder part. And then he turned to Cal Harris, who was the engineer, God bless him. And, and he, he said, okay, erase the strings and erase the oboe. And wow. I went, no, what, what? No, 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 no. No, wow. they're so beautiful. And you must have paid 60 grand to have that session on there. What, why are you going to erase it? He said, because I don't want to get into the mix and have to wonder. I don't want, you know, I don't want Lionel to say, let me hear it with the strings. Let me hear it without the strings. Let me hear it with the oboe. Let me hear it without the oboe. Let me hear it with the oboe and Michael. Let me, wow. he said, I'm just making a decision. And he just erased them until halfway through the song, you know? And, and, and I said, you know, so you've got a backup tape of this. It was like, no, no, no. I made a decision. I love that. Yeah. And so, so we're here with Michael and we have 200 and some right. like 220 different yeah, guitar no, solos on one song what do you do and 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 he's going oh i like that oh i like the first part of that and then you get to about 15 in and he says where was that other one right <laughs> and, you're going, and you're only 15 out of 200 and and you know that was something about quincy and bruce you know and 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 you know you know that that this is true where Bruce would the end would go, uh, oh, I would say, can I have another track to see if I can get a better performance? You didn't like that performance? Let's just erase it and do another one. Yeah. I'd say, no, 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 no. I, I, that, that one might be okay. Let me see if I can make a better one. What are you, chicken? What are you, what are you afraid to record? No. We're, <laughs> you know, if you don't like it, let's replace it. Bruce was, he was the master of the ship. Sure. Right. Quincy was absolutely the guy saying where the ship would go yeah, and who everybody on the ship was going to be allowed to be. But Bruce Wadian was driving the ship. Right. And, and, and uh, there were decisions made all the, there was, you know, if something wasn't right, <clears throat> gone yeah. next. Yeah. And, uh, and if you didn't like what you performed, let's do it again. Uh, and did, didn't have much patience for like a, uh, on the beginning of Thriller, we were trying to make a ba 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 on that those chords on the beginning, right? Yep. We they wanted a synth version of that, and I said, okay, well, you know, I, at the time, what had I done? I had done Gloria uh, for Laura Branigan again, and and uh, and a couple other hits like uh, the uh, the middle of uh, Jesse's Girl, gunk 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 that thing. Like, how do you do that? Well, it's five tracks. I put one profit five sound here, and then I change the sound and detune slightly, and then I do it here. And then an octave above, I do this, and I do this, you know, opposite sides with the tuning, and that's how I get that thick color. And they're like, you can't just play it all at once. And I was <laughs> like, no, that's not the way a synthesizer works. I have to, uh, even today, you know, you have to, to, to make them sound good. I think you have to really layer and manipulate them. Right. And uh, we developed a lot of that during that, the Michael Jackson era. So let, let me describe, um, these are my memories when I go back to the Bad Album. Uh, setting, if I knew that we had a Boddicker session coming up, 
Um, my recollection is it would take about three hours to get you set up because it was oh. racks of, I mean, oh, it, yeah, you know, that's, people, that's, a, that's a nice, that's nice. Usually at the end of when I was doing that, uh, I was carrying 60 synthesizers yep. right. and, uh, and, uh, I had the ability to put out, uh, five stereo mixes. Mm hmm uh at at the same time and uh you know i would uh, like on free willy which michael also participated in yep. when i was doing all the synth parts on that live with an orchestra i was playing 10 sequenced parts back live plus usually three or four parts that i was i was playing with my hands on the synthesizers and the 10 sequence parts uh, and and that was all going out to separate tracks and stuff. It was it was uh, uh, at the end. I think it took we allotted usually six to nine hours for just cabling, and, right. and that's why I stopped doing those three hour sessions. You can't. It took too long. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right in the early days when it was just an ARP twenty six hundred and a mini Moog and maybe a Poly Moog or an Oberheim six voice. Uh, before the Prophet Five came out, I had two sets, and I could piggyback right. you know, sessions. Just as long as it took me to drive from one session to the other, no. that's all I would ha have to worry about. That's awesome. Yeah, it was it was good. But so you remember the three hours? You thought three hours was a lot of work, huh? Well, I mean, I'm trying to remember. I wish I could remember your your Cartage guy back then. Um, is he well, there still? Were a lot of them. I know. Uh, yeah, well, the, we had Royal, we had Andy Leeds, uh, uh, Jimmy Gillio used to work at Royal, and now he's got mates. Jimmy's quite successful. Uh, it's awesome. great to see people grow up and and become successful. Um, yeah, I think but... Andy Leeds is running a, a tour company for bands and stuff, where he he sets up all the airplane flights and stuff. And uh, right, uh, uh, Jim, uh, the guys over at Royal. You know that's it's an interesting era that that day you know nobody would have thought of of it being a problem first off for me to have a guy on my salary on my come out of my payroll that actually wired my own equipment for no and me. i well i mean if it was you uh you know paulinho paulinho would be hours they'd back a truck up and yeah i mean it was a semi it was just yeah Absolutely. You, you never knew what Quincy was going to ask for. Right. And it was just this one for you. I mean, whoever your, your guy was, I mean, I know it was your, your show, but uh, I mean, it was just beautiful. It was this room of synthesizers that they would build for you. But at yeah. some point, I think it outgrew the control room. They'd have to kind of move you out to the studio. That's but, right. Um, at a certain was, time. And that was a problem. In one way, it was a problem. But but in the uh, in another way, if I was working with uh, somebody like a Humberto Gatica who liked to play the music really loud, right. he thought it, he thought it was funny every now and then while I'd be standing right in front of the speaker to like turn the snare drum way up and go bang. Yeah, I, I remember, wake you up. It's funny you say that because I remember I don't think Bruce did it uh, to be funny. But you never knew when Bruce was going to go upstairs, he would call it and, you know, hit the big monitors. And you were right in front of those big Westlake SM1s or whatever they were. Yep. And I remember you, you got, you got irritated. And I didn't blame you. <laughs> I mean, Bruce didn't, you know, he didn't do it to intentionally hurt you, but it would hurt. And oh, you, boy. you were right there. And I felt, uh, you know, he just popped it. And uh, you, you got some snare drum in the head. And, uh, <laughs> That, but he, but what Bruce wouldn't have done that intentionally. Bruce no. Bruce was such a sweetheart, and, no, and I, you remember he had the marks on the console, yep. and he had a timer where he would uh, he would only allow himself to listen as uh, uh, a on very big, high was, level, right, for a, a, a small amount of time, yeah, just to check to see what it would be like when it hit the clubs, yeah. Yeah, right. and, and for yeah, or if if he would leave and Michael would take his chair to listen to a playback or something, but uh, I then, remember then we what just, you one know one of those and, days at Westlake being in the adjacent room, <laughs> and and people have to understand that these rooms are two huh. double wall systems yeah. thick, yeah, right, 
And, and so, so you've got at least 12 to 18 inches of sound deadening material. And Michael would play the music so loud that being on the other side of those two walls was too loud to stand. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I remember there was that hallway leading back to Studio D. And back then they were throwing me, I'd, I'd be doing jingles. I'd work with Lanny and Jay and all those guys during the day. And then I'd run into Studio D. Bruce kind of gave me an open door to hang out. And, uh, and I would walk down that hallway to Studio D. And I'd, I'll never forget the way you make me feel in particular. You would hear that. And I mean, it would, it would shake the, you know, there's platinum albums on the walls. And, and it would be for a, for a kid. I mean, I was so young, but it was so exciting. It's like, I get to pull this door open. That's just, you know, it's like a movie scene of, you know, the air just pushing you back, <laughs> yeah. you know, and there's, you know, and there's you and Rod and Quincy and Michael and Bruce. And I mean, the Jerry the, and Greg, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. basically like it was a few weeks ago and I have to remind oh. myself that it wasn't, but it was, it was an amazing time. And, and it, you were, it was, uh, and you, you were a huge part of it. Well, I'm, I'm very glad and grateful and blessed to have been a part. Quincy and I talk often uh, these days. Uh, within the last couple months, well, right before COVID, I had had uh, two weeks in a row. I had about an hour and a half of when he told me, I'm producing six pictures. I've got 16 albums going at once. And, and you know, all the stuff that you go, well, that's changed because there's no way that you can listen to every playback right. on every record and do right. 16 at once. But, you know, he had that era where he did that. And, and I, I try to always express to people, people go, why was the music so good back then? Why, why isn't it that we're getting in? And, and I got to tell you, you know, there are so many artists. I just finished uh, working with Sean Mendez and his wow. songs are off the hook, man. He's and what a fabulous singer he is, yeah. you know. And the songs are incredible. Tom Hall is doing just a bang up job. Uh, we were just recording choir here, and uh, I, I, you listen back to those days, people go, Why was the music so good? Many reasons all came together. First off, there were budgets. People sure. actually paid for their music instead of stole it for free, right? Sure. So you you know you were getting ten dollars an album, which helped feed all these layers of people. You talked yep. about cartage a minute ago. You know today somebody gave you a six hundred or seven hundred dollar cartage bill, they they would freak out. Sure. And this this is nineteen seventy six and seven hundred dollar cartage bills. I remember uh, Emil Richards. His cartridge bill used to be thousands of dollars. Yeah. And like you talked about Paulinho, for a film date, Abel would imagine. just fill the back yeah. of, the, uh, of a big stage uh, just so that he had every tool available. Yep. Right? And, and that was, that was uh, so, so it, then we have the decision-making process where the technology didn't allow you not to make a decision. You had limited number of tracks and you had to, you had to make, be able to be in a position to go, yes, no, I like that, I don't like that. Yep. And uh, you also had people that were experts in their field. It wasn't somebody who sat down with the computer and, and there's not, nothing wrong with that, it's just different. <laughs> I'm just, but it wasn't something who was sat down with the computer and massaged a guitar part for 12 hours to make it sound good. You got Paul Jackson Jr., <laughs> David T. Uh, Williams, uh, or David T. Walker, uh, David Williams, uh, uh, Lee Rittenauer, Larry Carlton, Jay Graydon, you know, to come right. in, uh, Ray Parker, to play people who were the best guitar players ever, uh, Louis Shelton, uh, in, 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 in the world, the best guitar players in the world, to play their part, the best drummers in the world to play yeah. their part. Now, you know, used, used to be that they were 13 layers thick of those. 
If, if Jeff Picaro wasn't available, you got Jimmy Gordon. If Jimmy Gordon wasn't available, you got Jimmy Keltner. If yep. Jimmy Keltner wasn't available, you got John Guerin. If John Guerin wasn't available, you got Ndugu Chancellor. If Ndugu was Chancellor, you know, there was 13 right. different flavors going on. And and that doesn't happen anymore. I know. That, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. Uh, piano players the same way. Bass players. I mean, Quincy used to say, why would I write a bass part for Ray Brown? Right. Ray Brown's the best bass player in the world, but in and, and he plays. He's played it every day for the last fifty years, and he's he's the best in the world. Why would I try to tell him what to play on his instrument? Exactly. You know, and and uh, now people think that uh, if you have enough time, and I have a lot of composer friends who tell me this, mm -hmm. Michael, I'm not a keyboard player like you are. I don't consider myself a musician. I consider myself a, a composer. Right. And, and, and I play really badly for five minutes, and then I spend five hours correcting it. Editing it, right. Editing it. And, and uh, you know, there's, there is something to that day when people are exchanging ideas. Oh, uh, for any so of the kids watching this who haven't watched uh, the Wrecking Crew film, right? You know, those guys are. Uh, you see those pictures. All of those records, they have their little Fender and Gibson amplifiers on folding chairs at ear level, all pointing at one another, and they're all listening to each other and trading licks and ideas back and forth, and it's it's just this creative fest. And 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 you don't get that when you're one person in a room with a computer. No. Yeah. So so it it was a great era. I okay. and a, absolutely love it. And you had songwriters who were songwriters. <laughs> okay. so, right. Songwriters. Right. Not not have nineteen people contributing to one song. Right. Uh, uh, because they were contributing a loop of somebody else's song that they right. put up into a two bar section and said, this will work over that. And then and then that's their contribution as a songwriter. It's, we're, we're, it's an <laughs> we're old, we're old Boddicker face it. We're old. Oh, you know what? I'm still working. I'm still happy. We're still working. We're still happy. Uh, the music yeah. we make is still relevant. I know. Uh, I know. It's still. Uh, and I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't trade the experiences for anything. Oh, uh, neither would I. And uh, just to put a shout out, we talk about all this kind of stuff at Synthplex. Synthplex is probably going to happen. We're probably going to be allowed to happen a year from this November. Cool. I'm going to be, I should have been in LA right now, but that's not going to happen. So I'm going to be there in a year and I'm going to drag you kicking and screaming into one of my events. And I, I would I love no to have problem. you be a part of it. You're a joy, Brad. You're, yeah. you're an absolute joy. I love that you're doing this. I love to be able to remember uh, the great parts. Well, and I think it's important. I mean, I'm not a real posterity kind of guy, but I think it is important. And, you know, what, what you worked on, what we worked on, it's timeless. And I think the, the stories need to be told and shared. And uh, so give me, um, give me a takeaway. I mean, you, you spent hours, thousands of hours working with Michael. Um, yes. what, what do you do with all that? How, how, give me a takeaway. Well, first off, uh, teamwork. Teamwork, if, if you can find a team of people that supports one another and is united in the same goal, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's much more important than being uh, the star. You know, uh, being part of a team like that for me. Uh, uh, work ethic, watching how, uh, and I talked about it already several times, how people focused in the studio. Yep. They, they, again, nobody was ever looking down at a cell phone. Uh, nobody was doing anything but pouring every ounce of what they could give into it. And it wasn't just one person. It right. was a whole team of people. So any takeaway is uh, uh, that teamwork. Learn how to make a decision. Don't don't doubt. If if in your heart, in your mind, you know something's right, don't be afraid to go with it. And then if you find out later that you were wrong, 
learn from your mistake and correct it the next time. Yeah. Don't let it stop you, but just keep working. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's really, really lovely. It's lovely to see all of those people still, still flourishing in, in the music that we made. Uh, lovely to see Bruce and Beast with Ian. Lovely to see Quincy. Michael Jackson had such wonderful aspects of, of work, uh, work ethic, uh, combined with, you know, and, and I, I'll say this with all respect. Yep. He was one of those people that had that 5% talent that he turned into 90, 900% with work ethic, you know, and I, and I don't mean to that. No, don't no, misinterpret, I don't misinterpret. No, that. I'm not. No, I know. Be, be, because you know that, that, uh, he, he played great in time. Mm -hmm. He played great in Same time. Too. Yeah. He played, he sang phenomenally. Mm -hmm. He danced. He worked. He did. He worked really hard at it. And it, it shows you what can be done if you are willing to give the time and give the hours. And, and it wasn't about the party. It was not about the party. No, but, but it through was, the hard, but it was so, but it was so much fun. I mean, when oh, you're with yeah. people that are on the same train, going the same direction, that level of talent, I, I don't remember a session that, I'm not going to say every day was, you know, uh, balloons and, and confetti. I mean, we, we all worked hard, but when you work on a team like that together, it's so much fun. And yeah. I, I, I do miss it. And so the, the other thing, it wasn't, I, there was not one thing about the money in there, Brad. You know, everybody came into work. And it, you, you know, that Michael Jackson drove a Rolls Royce at one period. Right. Before he got started being driven in an SUV. Right. Uh, when he drove his own Rolls Royce and Quincy, who never drove, you never know, you know, what his drivers, whether he was going to be driving, what, it didn't matter. He right. didn't care. No. Uh, uh, Bruce Wadian had a Bronco, yeah. you know, and, and, and they're selling 170 million records at a crack. And, and it's not about it wasn't. gold dripping or anything like that. It was about, let's make great music. Make a great product. Yeah, and, yeah, and the other thing, and I, I've touched on this with a few of the other guys, um, but you've you've made it, I think, crystal clear. Is even after all these years, and you know, we've gone different places. I mean, some are still active in the industry, others, you know, different direction. They're good guys, and Michael surrounded himself with, uh, you know, especially in those days, really good people. And yeah. Yeah. you and I, I mean, we don't, you know. We, we don't text each other every day or anything like that, but I feel like we can kind of, you know, pick up where we left off um, next summer when all this COVID nonsense is gone and we can uh, be in the same room together. Uh, yeah. I, I can't wait to give you a hug and spend some time with you and, uh, and, and get caught up. Uh, I'm, I'm right there with you, Brad. Thank you for letting me participate in this. Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure. It's, it's great seeing you. Uh, thank you for being a you part too. of this, uh, this special week and thanks uh, for being part of my life. Thanks for letting me remember good things. You bet my friend be, be blessed, stay safe. And I will, uh, I'll talk to you soon.